This film took a village, and so does the research. We're really hoping that the film can continue to drive this conversation, the research funding, everything forward. So moments like this are really important. Thank you, Denise, for being here with us and for making all of this possible. Neil used to always say that you're his earth angel, and you still are. And the love that you gave him and continue to give him just changes the world. So yeah, there's a lot to discuss. We have an amazing panel here. This is actually being filmed, so a lot of people who are not in this room will get to see this conversation, and we're so grateful that you're all here with us. If uh, each of you wants to just briefly introduce yourselves, uh, that would be great, and then we'll get into some questions. Dr. Walls, you wanna uh, introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Dr. Bill Walls. Um, I'm a physician. I practiced in North Carolina for about 30 years. When I was in my late 40s, I uh, had a health crisis that I came to know as chronic Lyme disease and um, overcame that and have been helping people in that journey, but um, unconventionally for uh, 20 years now, I guess, 15, 20 years, time flies. <laughs> I'm Marcia Herman Giddens. I have a doctorate in public health and a PA, and I used to practice pediatrics at Duke University Medical Center where I became interested in tick-borne diseases, which were very simple at that time. There was only one that we worried about. That was Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. I became a, a founding member, along with some other people, in 2005 of the Tick-Borne Infections Council of North Carolina. We're a small all volunteer nonprofit. We're free to join. Please join. You get a lot of good information. And um, I've been in various roles with the with Tick NC, and now I'm the scientific advisor. And there's several of us board members here tonight. Thank you all for coming. I'm Dave Alcorta. I'm a research scientist in Tim Haystead's lab. Uh, I joined Tim's lab uh, after ha having been in Neil's lab, uh, initially coming into his lab to do uh, work on breast cancer, which where he initially came up with a critical therapeutics uh, for treating breast cancer. Uh, then as his lab developed into looking at Lyme disease, I continued to, to work with him and Tim Haidstead's lab at Duke University uh, on that. And then unfortunate, with his unfortunate passing, we continue that work, and I moved over to Tim's lab full-time, uh, working on coming up with some of the compounds that we might uh, develop into therapeutics or diagnostic uh, uh, compounds. Uh, my name's Ed Brightsward. I'm a professor of medicine and infectious disease at uh, Veterinary College at North Carolina State University and an adjunct professor of medicine in Division of Infectious Disease here at Duke. Um, I'm actually at NC State responsible for three laboratories. One's a veterinary diagnostic lab that essentially tests for vector-borne diseases. It's been in existence since 1985. Um, the Intracellular Pathogens Research Lab, where we focus primarily on Bartonella, Borrelia, and Babesia at this point in time. And um, uh, the Biosafety Level 3 laboratory where we're fortunate to have facilities where we can work on these organisms safely. Dr. Rawls, I guess we'll start with you. You're closest to us, and then we'll, we'll go down the line. Something that we had talked about in the lobby that uh, that is very fascinating that we weren't able to really address in the film is the whole host of infections that people are coming into contact with. So Lyme disease, we always say, is the tip of the iceberg. Not just other tick-borne illnesses, but humans are coming into contact with so many pathogens, and in your experience, it seems that rather than focusing on one cause, one disease, one treatment, there's another approach. So can you speak a little bit about what uh, your own journey through Lyme disease taught you about how we might learn from and handle chronic illnesses in the future? Yeah, it, you know, 50 years ago, nobody had really heard of Borrelia. Um, and then there were co-infections, and then just this growing awareness. When I wrote my book, Unlocking Lyme, in 2017, there had been 12 species of Borrelia worldwide that was identified as causing Lyme disease. Uh, now that's up to 21. Um, so every year that passes, we learn more microbes. And so I think we're, what we're testing for 
is really just a small slice of the possibilities. Um, but, but through my research, through studying uh, the, the body of evidence out there, it, it's, I've become aware that it's not ever just one microbe. Um, you know, we said some pretty amazing things about Borrelia, but our immune system is pretty amazing too, and you could take Bartonella and say the same thing, and take Mycoplasma and say the same thing. You know, all of these microbes have mechanisms for winning. And when they reach a terrain in the body that's favorable, they can flourish. Um, but that, you know, looking at this as chronic infections is very different than acute infection. So an acute infection with a microbe is when it first enters the body. But where my attention has been over the past several years is looking at the state of dormancy. All these microbes have the ca capacity of entering and surviving inside cells. But there's mounting evidence that they can actually become dormant inside cells throughout the body, the heart, the brain, the joints, everywhere. And you know, so when the body is stressed, these things can reactivate, and it makes it really, really difficult to get rid of them with conventional antibiotics. In my journey, I had virtually every symptom of chronic Lyme disease. I had major heart involvement. I was one step away from needing a pacemaker because my heart was beating so irregularly. This was at age 47. And my intuition carried me away from the conventional system and I embraced high-dose multi-herbal therapy and over a five-year period regained my health completely. Um, and all the symptoms, the bad joints, the heart, everything resolved. Um, and I've been taking herbs now for about 15, 20 years continually. And at age 66 and in, enjoying some of the best health of my life. Um, so just there are a lot of different ways to solve this problem. And it's a very complex problem that you have, you can't look at the individual pieces. You've got to get as many pieces as you can and put that whole puzzle together to solve. Thank you for that. Yeah, I think it's a complex problem and it's gonna require a complex answer. And so um, I, really, I really appreciate it. Um, you diving into that. Um, Marcia, when we were making this film, we were often told that Lyme disease and ticks weren't in North Carolina. So I'm curious if you could talk about why Lyme and ticks stop at the border, uh, what you guys are doing to keep them out. <laughs> um, no, if you could talk about the prevalence here, the risk here, um, and how that's changed over the years. Um, okay, thank you for a question that I know a little bit about. <laughs> um, they do, some people think they still do stop at the border. Um, they're pretty smart creatures to do that. <laughs> no, um, and, and when we, when Tick NC started in 2005, the reason was that there were a number of people who, in the Piedmont here, who had Lyme disease and they thought they had gotten it in the Piedmont. And of course it was then the standard um, policy by the CDC and the state that there was no Lyme disease in North Carolina. Furthermore, there were no Ixodes scapularis, the black-legged ticks in North Carolina. Um, so that was one of our biggest battles. And it's still, unfortunately, the state um, has never done and, and still has, you know, it needs to be done, but, the, but one reason it's never been done is it needs to be done frequently because the state of the ticks, the species, where they are, how dense they are, the prevalence of various tick-borne infections, which are now up to 12, 10, 12, 13, depending on the tick of, of human uh, infections, and we're not counting alpha-gal from the Lone Star tick, um, is not known. I, and it's very, uh, it, it's flexible, at, and it's uh, affected by the uh, acorn crop, the mast, uh, and the number of rodents, and all kinds of other things. So um, eventually, uh, the, the um, the state public health people is a long, long story. You know, it's too much to tell. But eventually, the first case of locally, meaning in the Piedmont, diagnosed 
case of, P of Lyme disease that met the CDC criteria, the two-tier test, was in 2009. It made the headlines in the Mali News and Observer. And since then, um, there, and there always seemed to be a bit more at the coast until five years ago, maybe six years ago, there was none in the mountains. None, and I know very well because I have been going to the areas in mount the mountains for 50 years, and until that many years ago, there weren't even any ticks except for the American dog tick. Um, people had dogs. I went everywhere. I mean, my personal experience, but also now it has been studied. Um, there is a lot being made of the black-legged tick coming down the Appalachian chain from uh, Virginia, and it is. But what is forgotten, because I've been around um, quite a long time and uh, am one of the few people I think that still remembers the, the, some of the history of all this, uh, is that the black-legged tick has always been here. In fact, I, I brought a quote. You must have known that I had <laughs> brought this quote. I'd like to read it because it's a very recent quote. It's recently published by the CDC, actually, uh, Eisen and Eisen. Uh, in this year, 2023. The black-legged tick was considered a species of no medical concern until the mid-1970s. By that time, the tick's geographic distribution was thought to be mainly in the southeastern United States. People have forgotten there is a long history of the various species of ticks and where they were in very small pockets, and it has a lot to do, the changes have a lot to do with the change in the deforestation in the east part of the United States and the deer population. So there, are, it's like Lyme disease, that story is very complex. And as I said, it keeps changing, but now we're in a situation where we're overrun with deer, both the Lone Star Tick and the Black-Legged Tick overwinter on the deer. They pretty much require a big mammal for their reproductive cycle. And um, so the deer are everywhere in the middle of cities um, that is a big reason why the problem has become so bad because way long ago, it wasn't that the ticks weren't here or even the bacteria wasn't here, it was here, but it was in very, very small pockets and very few people were affected. That was a long, long time ago. And there's much more to say, but we don't have time. Okay. <laughs> Is just a story? Yeah, of course. My grandfather um, grew up uh, in his early life, he was a fur trapper and fur trader, um, hunter, fisherman, his whole life. But I did not know him that way. He came into my life, or I came into his life fairly late. Um, and the story I always heard was that he was disabled by age 40. And the whole time I knew him, he had terrible arthritis, fatigue, insomnia, and the full range of what I now know as chronic Lyme symptoms. But he was never diagnosed with Lyme disease because he died in the late 1970s just as our definition of Lyme disease was coming on the scene. He spent virtually all of his life in North Carolina. Yeah, the, it's the, uh, someone helped me with the pronunciation, the Montauk in Long Island, is that how you say the town? You know, there is a condition um, called Montauk's knee, which is thought to be way back, you know, with the Native Americans uh, were basically had, I think, probably what we call Lyme disease now. But it w unlike the 500,000 cases we think that are happening now every year in the United States, that there, there were much, many smaller uh, numbers of people affected a long, long time ago. So this has been a problem for a while. <laughs> And hopefully some people in the audience don't yet have this issue and you're learning, uh, you're ahead of the rest of us and you can keep yourself and your families uh, hopefully more safe with this awareness. And uh, yeah, so now we're gonna talk about diagnosing and, and treating these illnesses. Our first phone call that we ever had with Neil, we were sitting in a little cafe in my hometown, my little farm town in upstate New York, and we had been hearing about Dr. Neil Spector from all these people. You have to talk to him. Dana Parrish connected us, and I'll never forget it. We were sitting there, and one of the first things he said was, you know, one of my biggest goals is to bring people in from outside this field. We need people to be looking at this with a fresh perspective, 
And that was just this dream of his. And we had no idea, and he had no idea if he was going to achieve that. And then here you are, and Tim Haystead and your whole lab, and there are some people here in the audience who are working on this research as well. I mean, we were barely able to scratch the surface on all of this in an hour and a half, you know, an hour and 40 minutes. Clearly, there's so much more to this picture, including your research. One of the most common questions that we get after screenings around the world <laughs> is, what is happening with Neil's research and the team at Duke? So can you tell us what's happening? <laughs> sure, sure, no problem. Um, so before I start on that, I, of course, we'd like to thank you guys for doing such a great job and yeah. presenting the, pro the overall problem. Uh, in addition, I'd like to thank, obviously, the Bay Area yeah. Lyme and uh, the, the Cohen Foundation, Foundation for their generous funding for mm -hmm. that sort of thing. And then I have to say, it's amazing what Neil has done and Tim have done to bring everybody there. Um, Matt Redenbow from UNC is another member of that group. Obviously, Ed is uh, a, a part of the Bartonella component, so we're actually not just addressing what's going on with Lyme disease. We're also interested in looking at uh, things that could uh, impact Bartonella. Uh, Monica, who you saw in your uh, embers, uh, is another key member of the, both projects for the Bartonella mm -hmm. and for the Borrelia. Um, so we just uh, two, three weeks ago published a paper in which we are very excited about um, some of the compounds or the model of, of trying to develop therapeutics for identifying if they are there and two, potentially trying to use them as a therapeutic. And basically, this is very early in the process. Um, and to give you a little bit of a thumbnail sketch of what we are trying to do, at some point you saw an uh, image where you had the green DFPs and some plates and stuff like that. Essentially, what Tim Hasted had started out was looking at proteins that bind the ATP molecule, uh, proteins that are critical for their function for binding that. And he identified some of those proteins could be targets for compounds to inactivate them. Uh, this type of purinome protein, the ATP binder, is valid and is really important in all organisms. And so different species have different proteins that function that way. So the idea was to, to take that and redirect that to Bartonella and Borrelia and identify potential targets that bind ATP to then come back in and screen a large library of about 4,000 compounds that would then inactivate that protein um, and then see exactly how that does that and how we might be able to use that uh, compound. Uh, so for example, with Matt Redenbow, it's really critical we need to know a 3D structure for that protein and how that compound gets into that structure so we can start to look at how a whole team of chemists in Tim's lab can come in and start to modify that chemical so that we can tag a few things on the side that won't interfere with its interaction with that protein. And so uh, we recently identified a protein that will bind to Borrelia that we could put a little tether on it and then put a compound on the outside that when you shine light on it would emit some activated oxygen uh, to kill the bug. And so that's what we call a berserker molecule. And it was the paper basically identifying that we've identified a compound that may be able to be modified in other ways to, to be both um, a, a antibiotic, but also with that tether, we might be able to put something else on the outside that would actually be able to be seen in, a, in an MRI or a PET scan, something like that. So when you give it to the patient, it would disseminate through the body localized to where those bugs are, and you'd be able to say, oh, look, we can't see it there. So Neil talked about that in terms of the theragnostic for that mm -hmm. sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So we are at a point where we are trying to identify those compounds, the linkers that may be necessary, the compounds we want to put on that end of that linker that might be able to do that. At the same time, trying to wean out its ability to interact with human proteins because we don't want to give something that's going to kill you because <laughs> when we activate it, it's not going to be good for you. But the key is that it's one of those aha moments that Neil had where we could actually see that compound binding to bugs and tissue to now where we're actually being able to use those compounds 
to show we have some biological activity with it. So that's the basic arch in what we're doing and, and it's continuing with the funding from, from Bay Area and from the phone company. Totally. It's, it's worth noting too, so on uh, our website, we link to all of these amazing foundations that are funding the research. We have a button that says uh, donate to uh, Neil's research and it'll lead you to the page where you can help fund the continuation of this research. So thank you so much. As people who have gone through this, it means a lot and I know that you'll have no shortage of people begging you <laughs> to try should, out your medicine on them. Obviously with, with Monica, who has an animal model system, we're already trying to take, at least in the case of one of the Bartonella compounds, trying to put that into animals to see exactly what's going on. So it's not just a, a bench top thing. Yeah. We're actually, the critical thing, the whole team is together where we can develop it here, look at it in that crystal structure, modify it, and then pass it on to uh, look at it in Bartonella. Fortunately, Borrelia requires an intermediate uh, tick. So so our lab, Sin's lab, can grow the bugs, and we can do a lot of those experiments at Duke without any problems. I mean, it's a certain amount of safety. But Bartonella is a whole other uh, ball game, and Ed's lab actually grows that, and we can take those same compounds down under more strict biosafety conditions and test our compounds in collaboration with Ricardo Maggi down there. So that's what that ends up. Yeah. Amazing, thank you. Dr. Breitschwert, um, I know you work with animals, and animals have often been, been considered to be the sort of the sentinels of disease and these types of things. So I'm wondering if you could talk about your experience working on tick-borne diseases with animals and what we might learn from uh, what the animals, what, the, what diseases in it, animals are telling us about how we might treat these diseases in humans. Um, as many of you know, in veterinary medicine, we've got five companies making vaccines that are used by veterinarians to protect dogs against Borrelia burgdorferi. Um, we've also have companies that have made tests that veterinarians can do within 15 minutes within their office to say whether there's actually antibodies against the proteins that were demonstrated up there. And one specific protein is so highly specific that we've tested a few thousand dogs from South America and n only found one dog that came up positive on the test. That dog happened to have lived in the New England area and ended up in South America. <laughs> so, you know, I, I think using that test, we started looking at Lyme disease in dogs um, back in and around 1986. And uh, at that point in time, my comment for almost 10 years was a dog would have to work very hard to acquire Lyme disease in the state of North Carolina. And I think it wasn't that a dog couldn't get it here, but as Marcy said, he'd have to be at the right place or the wrong place at just the right time to get the right tick to get the disease. But over the years, we published additional studies that changed that to the point that one of my PhD students about five years ago could statistically put a line across the state of North Carolina based on this specific test and say, if you're above that line, transmission is occurring to dogs. If you're below that line, we can't put a p-value on it that transmission is occurring to dogs. Doesn't mean it's not occurring, just statistically couldn't do it. So I think in that respect, dogs are, and CDC has actually acknowledged this, is one of the better models to track Lyme disease movement, and you can go to what's called the CAPSI web website or the Companion Animal Parasite Council website, and they will actually bring it down to your zip code and tell you what the frequency of Borrelia burgdorferi exposure is in your particular area. So I, I think that's one area where veterinary medicine can be very helpful in interacting with human medicine. If we go to the genus Bartonella, um, other than having heard the word here, how many people have ever heard of the diagnosis Bartonellosis? Oh, well, that's, that's pretty good. 
That's a lot more than I thought. <laughs> it's, the, so, it's the right crowd. Yeah, it's an educated crowd. Yeah, that's right. It's a really biased crowd. <laughs> you, found, you found your room. Yeah, most of the time I wouldn't get that many. I, I've come to believe, and in lectures that I give to veterinarians or physicians in the audience, that the dog, who's clearly my best friend, when I get him home and let him out of his kennel, um, <laughs> is the best naturally occurring animal model for human bartonellosis. And veterinary workers are the canaries in the coal mine or the best sentinel population by which my physician colleagues at Duke and UNC and elsewhere are going to understand the disease bartonellosis. And I think I can base that on the fact that we discovered the disease Bartonella or the organisms Bartonella because of the AIDS epidemic. So before 1990, we did not know that a cat, a dog, a horse, or a human in the North American continent was ever infected with this entire genus of bacteria. We then, based on work done by David Wellman at Stanford, figured out that AIDS patients with very unusual pathologic lesions had one of two Bartonellas, one which was known to exist that causes trench fever in World War I, and another one that wasn't known to exist, and we only had DNA sequences at that point in time, that became the organism that causes cat scratch disease. So I guess my concluding comment from veterinary medicine is as a person who spent most of his career studying tick transmitted diseases in North Carolina, the southeastern United States, and collaborations around the world, I'm more concerned about fleas because fleas are ubiquitous throughout much of the world. Um, and people don't usually worry about fleas until they have an infestation. And we know in the laboratory fleas can transmit three different Bartonella species. And so we've gone from not knowing this genus of bacteria exists to over 40 some species now. And for me as a veterinarian, the big problem is there's more vectors that we know are competent to transmit Bartonella than most of our tick transmitted organisms. And then finally, again, as a veterinarian, I'm responsible for all those animal species, including cats and dogs and coyotes and bats and pocket rodents that people like. I don't particularly <laughs> like them, David. Ferrets, but ferrets. Yeah, <laughs> ferrets that are carrying these organisms around. And as crazy as it sounds, on an evolutionary basis, these things have co-evolved with their specific reservoir host over millions and millions of years. So we have a genus of bacteria we didn't know existed because we didn't have diagnostic tests that were good enough to tell us that they existed. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. We hear people ask that question a lot. Why does my veterinarian test for Lyme, uh, but my doctor won't? <laughs> so it's, uh, yeah, it's a baffling situation. Having conversations like this are, I think are really important and continuing them as well. I hope that some of you, you know, are meeting new uh, friends and community tonight. It's certainly been a big part of our healing journey is having access to people who understand what you're going through. Does anyone have any questions for our panelists? Yes. I'll do the ticks first, and Morris, you can too. <laughs> you know, there, we actually have an investigator at NC State that is currently looking at ticks from Chernobyl. So they survived that catastrophe and right. seem to be doing just fine. I think the premise that we're going to find something that will specifically target ticks and eliminate them is extremely unlikely. Yeah, I, I think the other thing that I remember hearing about is is trying to intervene in the intermediates. So, for example, from my understanding in New England, if there's going to be, if they do a mouse 
population count and if it's very high, they know that it's gonna be a bad tick season. So, you know, there was attempts to basically try to, to increase sterility in mice or various ways of trying to knock down the mouse yeah. population to, inter, to, to cut down the, the intermediates for uh, transmission to, to, to deer and things like that, so. And also, um, I agree with you, Ed, the, the ticks are here, you know, they, they were here way before the dinosaurs. There's some pieces of amber that have ticks in them and unfortunately, I think they're here to stay and of course the bad part is they're getting worse and worse. Um, the, there have been experiments, I know a really neat one was on an island called Mohegan off the coast of Maine because it was too far for deer to swim to and they, they had a terrible Lyme disease problem. They got rid of all the deer. The Lyme disease problem amongst the residents pretty much disappeared. But then um, I think the latest I've heard is somewhat come back, but see the problem is the birds, right. you know, other animals. So uh, it would make, I think it, I do think the deer are a very important component when, in the year, you know, hundreds of years ago when the, the Native Americans were here and they uh, burnt, they actually did a lot of control burning and the, there was, and then later the mm -hmm. co colonists came and it was uh, deforested so there wasn't a, much of a place for deer, the population went way down, the number of ticks went way down uh, and now it's come back and it's just seeming to be out of control. Um, well, they come up and spray to get rid of mosquitoes. Well, see, mosquitoes, of course, the thing about mosquitoes, and incidentally, I think it's interesting for people to, to know that traditionally in the public health system um, in this country, mosquitoes have gotten a lot more attention. They continue to get a lot more attention. Mosquito control, part of that, or most of it actually, is trying to eliminate malaria and yellow fever way back. Mm -hmm. But mosquitoes breed in water, and you can somewhat target sources of water, you know, the puddles, the, the uh, uh, you know, containers, all kinds of things like that. Ticks are just everywhere. So it's, it's um, you know, there are a lot of local things, I mean, things that are, can be applied locally, you know, aside from insecticidal type sprays, they're looking at fungi, they're looking at all kinds of things, but it's, um, I, 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 hate, I hate to say it, but uh, it seems kind of hopeless to me that the ticks are gonna ever be under control. Yeah, and it's a situation where we, I miss Neil every day when we start talking about this because he's the interface in terms of what's the status on the Lyme Rex or the vaccines coming back. I don't, I'm not in touch with that. And so um, I, I can't give you any idea in terms of what's going on with that sort of thing. Yeah. It would be another intervention step to, to sure. shut that down. So. Well, and Mar Marcia, I think you were alluding to this, but there are things that you can do to your specific lawn that they're researching right now. A lot of them, unfortunately, are very expensive, and there's, there's some mixed sort of research around how effective they are, but we know plenty of people who do claim that they are effective. So that's things like setting out bait boxes so the mice run through them in your yard. It kills the ticks on the mice. Um, you can do it for deer as well, potentially. Uh, but the Cary Institute for Eco Ecosystem Studies in New York, which is where sort of we start in the beginning of the film, um, they are doing some research, long-term research, on treating people's yards and seeing how that affects their tick incidence. And you could Google that, I'm sure, and, and find those findings and, and read about what you can do for your lawn. Uh, the second question was about um, treatments, holistic treatments, and also success stories. And I'm wondering if you wanted to take that, Dr. Rawls. Well, first on the tick thing, um, ticks have been biting humans since the beginning of humans. And those ticks in amber from Dominica, which is down in the Caribbean, had Borrelia in them. So this is a long-term thing. And a question that we should be asking is, why, with Borrelia being in, present in North America for 60,000 years that we know of, why are people getting sicker? Why are people getting sicker? Because we all live indoors. We are, there are more ticks with global warming. I don't think there's much doubt, but think about it. Your ancestors mostly spent most of their time outside. So they were getting bitten by ticks that had Borrelia in them. This is not a new microbe. Why are people getting sicker? So second question. Um, Every chronic Lyme patient is different from every other chronic 
Lyme patient. And I've come to know that from just talking to literally thousands of people. And we all have a different journey. And so it's not just the microbes. It is the terrain that the microbes are in. So it's food you're exposed to, the environment that you live in. There are a lot of other stress factors. And it's also, it's, it's not just Borrelia alone most of the time. You know, we talk about uh, various different co-infections, um, but there's just a lot we don't know. Um, they found that one tick species carried over 237 different families, genera of bacteria. So there are a lot of things <laughs> out there that may be a factor. So it's, it's never just one microbe. I, I, you know, microbes work together to create a, cre a terrain inside the body that favors microbe growth. That's what microbes do. All th their purpose is to make more microbes. And so they're working together. And that's where my, my interest has carried me is just seeing this, this possibility of, of you know, a, a, a much larger picture. Um, I used herbal therapy successfully and I've worked with literally thousands of people that have had success, but that doesn't mean it's, a, it's the answer for everyone because we're all different and we all pick up different microbes. Um, so I think it's, it, it can be part of that foundation um, that's really important. And as, uh, so the advantage of the herbal therapy um, is that all herbs have antimicrobial properties and some are really good as far as their antimicrobial properties. But with you, when you're taking an herb as opposed to an antibiotic, you're, you're basically borrowing the plant's entire defense system and it's selective. Um, this has actually been documented by scientific studies and certainly over all of my time being able to observe the fact that when you take an herb, it has a suppressive effect on pathogens, but it doesn't disrupt your normal flora, which is really important because that's the roadblock that we run into with antibiotic therapy. Long-term therapy is the answer. I've been taking herbs for 15 years steadily every day, but you have to have something that the body can tolerate and antibiotics um, you run into the roadblock that it, eventually you're going to disrupt your normal flora and your normal flora are a really important part of your microbial defense system. Um, and you know, so for, for some people, it's an answer that includes antibiotics, other kinds of therapies, herbals as a foundation. And in the Lyme community, I see, you know, over the time that I've been doing this, there is a move toward really embracing herbal therapy as the foundation. And then outside of that, you know, some individuals will need antibiotic therapy or various th other kinds of therapies to really get them where they need to be. As far as cases, um, I don't know that there is a defined log, um, but there are groups that are collecting data. Uh, there's a group out in California that is collecting data, but literally, there have been tens of thousands of people that have reported benefit with herbal therapy. Dr. Rawls, what is, what is your website for people to find you and the work that you do? I, I've got a website called rawlsmd.com that I post a lot of information. Um, I've written a couple of books on the topic. Yeah, great. There's also a, um, an organization called My Lyme Data. It's mylymedata.com through LymeDisease.org, um, and they're collecting That's that information that, that Dr. Rawls was mentioning. Um, they're trying to sort of create a compendium of what worked for folks, because as Dr. Rawls said, it is really different. Lindsay and I were both very sick. We took different paths to getting better, and we took many, many different things. Antibiotics were definitely something that we took, but herbals were for sure something that we take and still take. And so it is a complex approach to treating these diseases, and that's why we need better research to understand what's going on. Um, do we have other questions? Yeah, right, right here. Dave, do you see a role for AI in treating current clinical diagnosis? <laughs> <laughs> um, and, 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 exactly. 
Thank you, Phil, Phil Clemmer. Uh, I leaned over to him in the middle of that when we were talking about <laughs> diagnosis and said AI. You know, the bottom line is a lot of the, uh, you know, current technology should be able to be fed in with all the information about different uh, symptoms and feed out a pretty straightforward list of, of uh, tests and, and that sort of thing. Um, in addition, it's going to know the statistics of how many times there's a false positive or false negative. So the key there is, uh, you know, not relying on a single test and coming up with PCR-based tests for all the different compounds where the sensitivity goes way up uh, for that. And, uh, you know, I was just thinking about Ed talking about Bartonella, you know, trying to identify other than reactivity, you, they have to collect blood over three, over a week, three separate times to be able to identify that there may be Bartonella in the blood so that they're coming up with something that's definitive. Help of computer technology is really important, I think. It gets out of the hands of, oh, I'm a, not a believer. Just go ahead and do this. Mm -hmm. I, I think I would also point out, you know, I think Neil was this perfect blend of, of science, and as you were saying earlier, science and spirit. And one of the first things that Neil told us, and that we actually had at the very start of the film for a long time, he did a TED talk about this, was about the art of medicine. And right. so one thing that he would always harp on is we need this new technology right. to give us data that is indisputable. And yet as doctors, we also have to rem re um, remain listening and we have to hear our patients. And so he was able to believe without needing AI, right? right. He was able to oh, believe yeah. but, but without. He was a rarity. You know, Ex that's exactly. A, that's a situation exactly. where someone out in the field in a small clinic, totally. you know, is, and the question of how many people are going to be seen in a hospital where you've got the For best sure. of the best For versus sure. a small clinic, right. where they really need to be able to say, oh, uh, most of the time I see this as such and such, but right. it could be the other. Well, that's why the, a, a better diagnostic is so, is so yeah. deeply important, but I think it's also important to remember Neil's approach, which was how do we, how do we yes. remain listening? He was the house. He was and the house. The the, the old uh, exactly. TV show house. Yeah, yeah, right? perfect. Like, yeah, yeah, ah, yeah. Yes, I remember. Yeah, that. yeah, <laughs> totally. His compassion that he brought to patients, I think, is is Much and his intuition you. is a lesson is a lesson all right. for all treating uh, physicians. All right, so let's do let's do one more. Uh, here you in the back here. Yeah. Um, I'm a bench scientist, so I'm going to only defer a little bit in the sense of, you know, we are at the beginning point of trying to get it into animals and understand what happens in animals. Um, Neil took a drug all the way from the bench all the way to clinical trials in patients, and so it's a situation where we, how many targets are, are, do we have in terms of the potential for failure at any given point. So um, I, I'm sorry, I can't, I really just can't give you, a, you know, Neil said three years, we're at three years, you know, it's, it breaks my heart, we're not closer, um, but we're, we're hoping to, it'll keep going through. I don't know if Ed said any issues with veterinary compounds. I mean, in veterinaries is a little easier because you're de dealing with animals, but uh, mm -hmm. so. I, th I think everybody that's involved with the Lyme and Bartonella Consortium between NC State, Duke, and Tulane um, is inspired by Neil and has the same passion for moving this forward as fast as we can because like Neil, I get those same emails every day from sick people and I'm amazed at the number of people with chronic illness that exist in this country for which they've been to six doctors, 10 doctors, 12 doctors. So we clearly have to do better and we have to do it faster. Um, I didn't sleep the first year we got the Cohen Consortium grant. I can now sleep because we actually have some targets that we know kill Bartonella. Um, they've already demonstrated a target that will kill Borrelia. We've just got more work to do to make sure it's safe and effective. Thank you all so much for being here tonight. Thank you all.
please stay in touch. We've always said this is not just a movie, it's a movement. And if you scan this code, you can fill out a brief survey. We're collecting information on every person that comes to a screening. We so want to know about you. And What's that? Yeah, Julia. Uh, update oh, update, update on, Julia. on Julia. Julia is in medical school. Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> we had a Zoom call with her just a couple nights ago. I mean, he was just with her in person, but we're very close with Julia and her family, and she wants to be a part of the change. And her two older brothers are also, one of them is a doctor, and the other one's becoming a doctor. And so they've turned this really hard situation around into trying to make a difference in other people's lives. And I hope that each of us, without putting too much pressure on yourself, wherever you are in your journey, you can find inspiration from Julia and Neil and try to find a, a, a even the smallest purpose and and hope. Keep in touch. Uh, we have a newsletter where we share updates about our subjects in the film, the research that's happening, our partner organizations. Um, we really need you guys. So thank you again, and have a wonderful night.